Today, I'm speaking with Marissa Burt. Marissa, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you for having me. I'm glad to be here. Absolutely. It's great to, to meet you. And before we get uh, started here with your bio, I do just want to give a quick content warning. Uh, number one, I'm usually interviewing people who are out of Christianity, as my, my main viewers know. Uh, Marissa is a Christian. I think it'll be obvious so that this is an important topic or a set of topics we're talking about today and that there's a lot of things we can glean. And as I've said many times on my channel, um, there is some really good reasons to partner with progressive Christians to talk about some of the toxic parts of Christian culture. So uh, if, if it is still if it is an issue for you, though, to, to be hearing from uh, Christians today, please feel free to skip to the next interview. Uh, the other part of this is I want to make sure we're uh, addressing the fact that we're going to be talking a fair amount about corporal punishment, spanking, and even child abuse today. So uh, if there are children in the room, please feel free to you know listen to this one later. And if it's triggering for you, feel free to pass as well. But otherwise, I wanted to introduce Marissa again. Uh, Marissa lives in the Seattle area with her husband, who is an Anglican priest. They have six children. Wow. Your house is busy. Uh, she's also a podcaster. She's an author of several uh, fantasy sci-fi books, uh, including uh, ones called Storybound, Story's End, uh, A Sliver of Stardust, The Twelve Dares of Krista, and A Legend of Starfire. She's also co-writing a book that's not out yet. It'll be out uh, later this, uh, is it this fall? Uh, 2025. Fall oh, I'm sorry, 2025. 2025. Uh, she's co-writing a book with uh, author Kelsey Kramer McGinnis. It's called In the Way They Should Go which of course is the uh, allusion to Proverbs 22.6, but in the way they should go, how the Christian parenting empire shaped a generation of evangelicals and where we go from here. I uh, absolutely will be buying that book when it comes out. Please let me know. Um, I, I can't and wait. I to... should say, we, I just heard from the publisher last week and the title has actually changed. I meant to okay. you before, but the new title is, and I think it will stick, is called The Myth of Good Christian Parenting. How okay. false promises betrayed a generation of evangelical families. So nice. similar vibes. <laughs> yeah, well, your your word Smith myth, word Smith myth. Mm -hmm. I love that. That's great. See what uh, see what sticks. Well, um, before we get into your story and before we talk about some of these very difficult topics, um, if you could just tell us a little bit more about yourself first, and then we'll get started. Sure. Well, right now, writing is the thing on my mind. I just finished Kelsey, and I just finished editing up this book. So a lot of time. In words, but I find myself itching to write another novel. I don't know if any of y'all have done NaNoWriMo, anyone listening, the National Novel Writing Month. But yeah. whenever November comes around, I think about it every year. Maybe I could write. If you're not familiar, it's kind of like a global online contest where you try and write a novel during the month of November. So maybe that'll be in, in fall plans. But um, other things here in Seattle, it's very rainy and cold and all the cozy vibes. So a lot of puzzles and candles and books and time to turn on the fire. So nice. that's, what, that's what's going it. on in my, my world. Can I ask this about your writing? Sure. Do you ever do a sort of stream of consciousness audio recording to get some of your content done? Like just take a walk and start talking about a topic and see what comes out of it. Um, for this, for the, this is my first nonfiction book. And there was one chapter it might have been a chapter on corporal punishment, actually, where I had just been doing so much reading and research that rather than I had an outline, but I just I did do that where I just talked about it, all the things I wanted to make sure to cover and then voice text transferred that to a document to kind of see it. So it was the first time. But do you do do you do something like that? It was interesting. I do. I do. Well, well, I love how Facebook Messenger lets you leave, leave like a 10 minute message. Right. And sometimes I'll catch up with people that way. Yeah. And I'll find myself sharing something that's on my mind and on something will come out of my mouth. I'm like, that literally just came out of your mouth. But where, like, where did that come from? That's really a good idea. Like, why don't you develop that? I'm like, yeah. well, why couldn't I have just like put it on paper and thought of it, but it took the, the stream of consciousness and the conversation as mm -hmm. it were to do it. And sometimes I'll end up taking that same concept and just start recording, you know, as if I'm recording a journal entry or something and just see what comes. And I it's do the same thing. I make up a lot of kids yeah. songs and I'll just start. Like I'll just, I'll often, when I'm in the car, I'll have a little like lapel mic and I'll just, I'll just, you know, have the audio recorder on and I'll just start just making up songs every two minutes. Some of them sound okay. And I'll develop them later. And some of them sound pretty like, ah, it's nothing there. But <laughs> if you're driving for 30 minutes, you end up with a couple song ideas and you know, it's pretty cool. Yeah. Um, well, yeah. we're, we're here, of course, to hear about some of the topics that are on your mind. But before we do, uh, could you please just give us an introduction as to your experience with Christianity? When did you come to know the Lord? And then we'll jump from, you know, obviously, we're not going to jump from there into your deconversion. Uh, but we will jump a little bit into what we I, maybe you'd consider in the bucket of deconstruction. Maybe we'll jump into that and then we'll jump into some topics. Sure. Yeah. Um, I uh, 
first heard about, um, first heard what I would say is the gospel presentation. I was actually um, probably about four or five. There was a thing in the eighties that a Billy Graham's ministry would do where they would show movies in the movie theater. So I don't remember what the movie was. I don't remember any of it, but I do remember as a kid finding it compelling and wanting to participate. And they would send me little comics, um, like Bible story comics after that. So I remember that. So um, that has been a part of my, um, really my formate, my spiritual formation has been part of my growth into adulthood and into adult formation. I would say I really came, came to own the faith for myself in my teenage years, really uh, resonated with a lot. You shared some of your story, Tim, um, was very zealous, was very intense. Um, now I know um, that I have some uh, scrupulosity, some religious OCD ways of engaging, but in young adulthood was was very much either either or thinking. And so whenever I did the math about tenets of the faith, it led me to an extreme place, right? Like if these were the stakes, then yes, I I probably missions, of course, like that's going to be a path or uh, of course, I remember in in college, um, there would be these these lovely gatherings where people would meet to pray for different topics. But it was kind of like, well, I will go to every one, you know, because if these if this is what we're talking about, how do you compare doing worth of eternal significance? So, needless to say, that became a really heavy yoke after a while. And um, I think I would pinpoint a uh, post college, I read um, John Krakauer's book, Under the Banner of Heaven. And it's a fantastic book. But if you're not familiar, it kind of traces the history of Mormonism, weaves it together with a narrative. And it was a light bulb moment for me, because as I was reading it, I was thinking, that's so wild what those Mormons believe. And yet there was a lot of the same thought processes in my own understanding of faith, as far as personal revelation and and different things. And so it was very uncomfortable realization for me around the same time. And I've written about this on um, Substack and elsewhere. I was newly married and we went to a non-denominational church. I I was kind of an eclectic uh, Christian background. We'd gone to a lot of Protestant churches. I went to Catholic schools, so kind of had a hodgepodge, which reflecting back, I'm, I'm very thankful for, especially since I had a lot of that intensity. Like, I think if I had been in a very intensely Christian environment, um, that would have been, that would have been uh, maybe exponentially a disaster. But anyway, I went, we went to non-denominational church and um, they divided the men and women in, it was like their marrieds group. And they gave the women the excellent wife by Martha Peace. And they gave the men the exemplary husband by, I think it's Stuart Scott. Mm. And wow, I remember going in and, and there were women in that room. One woman I still remember was like, I threw that book. I ripped it in half and threw it across the room. Right. And if you're not familiar, this is a very, still very popular in, um, Nuthetic or biblical counseling circles. It's, it's, um, very uber complementarian. It's very dangerous book. I think it enables a lot of abuse. It's, it's harmful, um, but it was really being presented as this is what it means to be. This is God's way to be married. And there were some other, we were, we were in a bunch of, we were new to the area. So we were trying to find communities. So that I was a teacher at the time, all the teachers, there was a different Bible study and all this kind of stuff. So anyway, um, for a couple years that continued a certain level of intensity of spirituality because uh, it feels good in a time of transition, I think, or when you don't know what to expect to have these rules or someone telling you the right way to do things can feel reassuring rather than looking around and, and thinking, how do, how do I navigate this or, or things are maybe difficult? Um, and then I would pinpoint welcoming children became a gateway out of that way of thinking for me, because even for a while after I rejected that way of thinking, I would return to it in times of stress or mm-hmm. when I was uncomfortable. And because again, it, it kind of promised, it made promises. We, we, in the work Kelsey and I do, we talk about prosperity, gospel, parenting promises. A lot of these book books make that kind of promise. Like it's like a prosperity ish marriage, marriage promise. Like if you do this, good things will happen. 
Um, but really having ha- welcoming children was a, a gateway out of that for me, because maybe what I was willing to entertain for myself, it reframed it all of a sudden. And I, I, I hear that for a lot of people, how their mm. experiences, especially if they were raised in Christian contexts or grew up in the church, it gets reframed when they see uh, their own child as an individual, it, it, it reshapes it. Um, so in any case, uh, that's a little bit of my, my journey for me. And, uh, I did go to seminary and, um, studied church history, which was hugely helpful in navigating some of those, those questions I had for, um, that, that I mentioned raised with under the banner of heaven and other things, understanding the breadth of church history, reckoning with, uh, some of the difficulty there of, of the violence of the of the harm done in, in the, under the banner of Christendom, um, the complexity of the line between good and evil running through us all, all of that was very helpful for my adult faith formation. I like landing in the Anglican tradition, which is a uh, high priority on an ecumenical approach. I like, I like that that is a piece of it. And um, anyway, as far as deconstruction goes, this is something also I've written about, a fair amount is um i think it's almost a inevitable stage of spiritual development regardless of maybe what faith community one's raised in i do think in the same way that we have different phases of development as human beings deconstruction is a necessary piece of of children who've been raised within certain frameworks and what that looks like i think can vary wi- wildly uh, depending on the nature of what children were raised in. And personally, I think the more um, heavily indoctrinating, the more children were perceived as like a bucket to fill with ideas, the more there is to deconstruct. Um, mm-hmm. So certainly as someone who, you know, my my husband's in parish ministry. So we see a lot of people uh, they coming from evangelical contexts will sometimes the Anglican tradition or a liturgical tradition will be the last stop out the door. Some people land there and stay and find shelter. They find a place to heal or, or a safe place to renegotiate their faith. Some people it's their last step um, on the way out the door for a variety of reasons. And uh, so I think this is something obviously of the current moment. I think for people within the church, it should be sobering to and should invite reflection. Why is it that so many who were raised in our communities have um, found it to be incredibly harmful, are recounting stories of deep pain and betrayal, who have been injured under our watch in that sense? Um, so I am mm. I am resistant when I hear a lot of people blaming or shaming or pointing fingers at deconstruction. I think it's not only a necessary stage of faith development. I think it's, there's a lot to own here. Um, There's a lot to lament. There's a lot to attempt repair where possible. Um, And I see a lot of parallels. I feel like I'm talking for a long time. So (laughs) this is not single time. I want to hear from you, but obviously a lot of thoughts, this, this came up. I, I see a lot of parallels with how this plays out in, uh, evangelical families in particular, uh, very similar patterns where adults, children become adults. They attempt to recount the injuries they experienced, the harm they experienced, or even just that they're choosing a new path forward or a different path forward. And um, there's an unwillingness and an inability to listen and instead a a message of shame and blame. So can I ask with your deconstruction and with all the questions that you went through and asked that got you to a point of changing some of your perspectives on, you know, gender roles and on parenting, et cetera. Sure. Did it ever get to a point where you did uh, seriously question whether or not the actual Christian narratives were true? In other words, is it possible that Yahweh and Jesus aren't real? Did I ever get to that level? Um, I mean, I think the questions are always there. I think for me, I had had such a personal spiritual encounter with Jesus that that was almost impossible for me to question that. Like I hadn't, I knew him in that sense. Um, 
So it more was a, a reordering of like, how do, how does this line up? You know, like, is, is this Jesus that I know the same that's going on over here? Like, what are the structures? I think of it sometimes as a uh, scaffolding, you know, I think for me, the rock solid foundation didn't change, but a lot of the scaffolding I came to see was kind of like add-ons, built-ons. And some of it was maybe just decorative and some of it was very wobbly or some of it was causing harm. And, and so I think of it visually that way a little bit. Um, Mm. But I certainly understand uh, and hear that from some people in that sense when I reflect back, I'm very grateful. I had a mix of traditions because I think the scope and breadth of the church has been nourishing for me to understand that there are different corners of the church who do things differently or believe differently or have a different perspective on the atonement or, or this sort of thing has been helpful. Um, I wonder sometimes if I had been very dialed into one thing, I think if that unravels, then it, it maybe would all crumble. I'm not sure. Yeah. Just, yeah. just out of curiosity, and this is, yeah. again, I, I know that my usual vis- visitors uh, and guests w- or uh, watchers would want me to turn this channel into a debate channel, and, and we're not going to do that today or anytime. But just out of curiosity, maybe sort of a devil's advocate question. Do you yeah. think that if you could see yourself in 10 years and the, the, the Marissa Bird of 10 years in the future has fully deconverted and has left and said, this is just mythology. How, how would that, like, would that shock your system to find that out? Or would that be mm-hmm. um, like just the un- unthinkable, unpardonable outcome? How would you see such a person if that could be, if you could yeah, foresee that that could happen? So, it's hard to know, right? Like so people change so much in 10 years. When I think back to me 10 years ago, I, I don't know, you know, in that sense. But I tend to think, as a person of faith now, I tend to think, I mean, it's either real or it's not. Like, my buy-in doesn't necessarily change that. Um, So if I'm in a place in 10 years where that's not something I hold in faith, I'm not sure it changes much for me about the view of the faith um, in that in that sense, I, there's a quote that comes to mind. This is Elizabeth Good. She says, um, if you lose your mind, you lose it into the hand of God, into the hands of God. And I feel that a little bit. I mean, faith is such a piece of me. I think it would be such a different personality, um, almost a different kind of conversion. If you want to say maybe the conversion is a different kind of conversion. Oh, yeah. It's hard to envision, but I, I speak to people like yourself. I know that's a bit of your story who are, who were at a point that sincere, that certain, that connected with the Lord or had a relationship or however, whatever language resonates. So I don't want to be like, well, clearly there's something I'm impervious to, but it's hard to imagine. Um, yeah. yeah, it's hard to imagine. I don't know. We can yeah. check back in 10 years. It is. Yeah. Let's check back in. please. <laughs> it, it is an interesting dynamic. And yeah, you, you don't, when you're deconstructing even to the point where you're like questioning all kinds of things for, right. for most of us, at least for me, for sure. I atheism was not on the table. I would have never guessed it. even a month or two before I deconverted, I would have said, there's just no way there's just, right. there's no way that the atheism is the outcome. And, you know, there I was a month or two later uh, after yeah. three years of very intense study. And it just, it just all crumbled in an hour. And I was like, wow, this, none of it, this is real. It's all, Did you, it's, I'm, I'm curious. Was that, did that come with a sense of loss or was it relief or was it grief or like what did, was it an emotional moment or was it more a naming of something that had already, what was that like? Just yeah, it was, it was, it was crazy. And by the way, for our viewers, I'm not going to take too much of our time. I, I, I don't know. We've got a lot to talk about, but I'll, yeah. I'll answer our, their I've question here. And then whatever we'll, you want to edit out. Yeah, too. I yeah. want to be sensitive to the fact that people may not want to hear. <laughs> no, this is, this is, it's a good question. Um, my, my viewers again have heard me say this enough, but um, I'll, I'll keep it short for their sake. But um, it was it was an interesting mixture of emotions for sure. Yeah. It felt like, you know, in the Matrix when they uh, first Jack Neo, Neo into it, like where they're they're training him, and he's yeah. learning jujitsu in ten seconds, yeah. and it's like you just feel like everything just went into your head all of a sudden. Yeah. Um, I describe it as as if your worldview was a set of dominoes, and you could you know if if deconversion is when they all fall down, when yeah. you start asking hard questions, 
you have theoretically the chance to kick them, but you're like a mile away. So your yeah. kicks don't feel like they're doing much, but yeah. you start taking these micro steps a millimeter at a time and it takes a while. Yeah. And eventually little do you know that you have, you've traversed that final mile right. and you take one last kick and all of a sudden it's all down. It just falls. Yeah. And that was, yeah. that was me. My emotions were when I, when I escaped that it, it was immediately like, I was, I was arguing with myself. I was saying, mm -hmm. it was like, there were two voices and it was, I was saying, Tim, say the words, say it. Like I just, mm -hmm. and it was almost like the pounding of a drum getting louder. And I was like, say the words. It's not real. None of this is real. And my immediate pullback was there's, there's, I was like, no, no, there's no way that, that humanity millions or billions of people have been deceived on mass and the whole planet. Mm -hmm. Like there's no way for 2000 years, there's no way. And I immediately thought, well, we all think the Buddhists are deceived. The Muslims are all deceived mm -hmm. en masse for thousands mm -hmm. of years. The Hindus have been around a lot longer than Judaism and Christianity. They're all mass deceived. Mm -hmm. If they can all have been deceived longer than we've been around, like, why couldn't we have been deceived? So that, that dropped. It's like, that's yeah. a ridic ridiculous objection. And I was like, say the words, Jim, say it. And I finally said it in my head. I was like, it's not real. And in the millisecond I said it, I was like, that makes more sense of my 43 at that time, 43 years of experience mm -hmm. than anything else. And I was like, I can't deny it. It's, it's mythology. And as soon as I said it and admitted it, everything crumbled. And I honestly started laughing. I guess it, it's a huge loss. And a lot of people, uh, you know, hate the loss of it all mm -hmm. because it feels like you've, you've lost your everything. Yeah. Um, but for me, what happened was, I immediately thought you could have gone to your deathbed thinking that this was real. You could have gone to your deathbed thinking you've been talking to a God this whole time. And you've been talking to the, to the wall and the, and the drywall and the ceiling fan. You're talking to yourself. You mm -hmm. could have easily gone to your deathbed thinking this, this mythology was real. And now you've probably at least got some time left. It's like, what a mind job this has been. Oh my gosh. I can't believe <laughs> I've wasted. I went to Bible college and was going to be a missionary. Like I, I was writing prayer books. Like this was my everything. It was like, yeah. I've, I've been talking to myself the whole time. I laughed and I felt like I won the lottery. The one part that I say to people uh, that hurts a lot, and it still hurts, mm. um, I wanted to go to heaven. Mm. Um, a lot of people at interview will say, no, it sounded boring. We were just going to worship this God is like this long worship service. Eventually, it's going to feel like, you know, this has got to stop at some point. This is boring. I did not feel that way. And I still don't feel that way. If that God had been, had been real. I wanted to go to heaven and I still do, honestly, it still hurts. Mm -hmm. And I don't look forward to the day that I'm an old man, where if I'm, if I'm of sound mind to realize my time is about up um, and I'm going nowhere. And that, that still breaks my heart. I still wanted to go mm -hmm. to heaven. And I, I understand what people say could get boring. I don't think it would have been for me. So yeah. um, anyway, I do, yeah. I do want to make sure I give you a chance to respond to that, but then we'll, after that, we'll get to, uh, to your Well, I'm topic. curious, the counterpart uh, of your question, do you, is there a scenario? Do you think of Tim in ten years of like exploring any religion, uh, Christianity, or another religious con context? Can you envision that, or of being religious or spiritual? Yeah, I can't. I mean, certainly, you know, yeah. when never say never. But um, I think what happens when you deconstruct and deconvert is is your spidey senses go up to your your bullshit meter gets real sensitive, and you're mm -hmm. just like, if if you're going to make extraordinary claims, it has to be absolutely extraordinary evidence. And mm -hmm. if, if you're going to give me, especially an ancient book, mm -hmm. I mean, you, you got to tell me not just who wrote it, where it came from, what is the, the chain of custody, who's had it, who's changed it, who's mm -hmm. altered it, how many versions are there? Um, you know, just there, there's, you would have, there would have to be so much evidence that, and also at that point, you'd have to ask yourself, what's the difference between a God and a really super advanced alien race? So like, how mm -hmm. would you know if they're, if, you know, if just an alien race has been around for a billion years. Yeah, could they look like gods to us? Um, sort of like in Stargate, that movie where, you know, these gods, you know, they look like ancient Egyptian gods and all they are was just aliens with much better technology. How would you know? Um, and also to make sure you're not, you know, some kind of trip to make sure you're not just imagining stuff. Um, but yeah, there's, there's, I, I'm sure it's possible, but from where I'm standing now, the rationality and the skepticism is pretty much my number one priority. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Interesting. Well, thank you. Yeah. yeah. I will say though that the, the one thing I'll, I'll say to you is uh, if you do ever find yourself on those on that very hard road, mm. um, just just for anyone, uh, maybe this deconstructing is not necessarily just for you, but anyone deconstructing, um, be prepared. If you are really in it and then you leave, you will expect that Christians will ask you questions like, "Why did you leave? 
Um, mm-hmm. can, can we talk about it? Can I share the gospel? Um, Christians will instead not do that. They will treat you like a traitor and basically say, go to, go to hell. And that's basically what the, the most deconverted people find and tell me their story. They a few people, yeah, a few people say it. That's where it's like, yeah, people keep sending me gospel stuff. Most mm-hmm. people say they just got written off and treated like traitors and as enemies of the church mm-hmm. and as, as if the devil's got you. So it's interesting, uh, interesting mm-hmm. outcome. But yeah, well, I don't want to um, dominate the, the conversation with, with that topic. I do want to make sure we get to your work, which sure. is, again, focused on Christian parenting. Um, again, we'll start with that verse again, Proverbs 22, 6, train up a child in the way he should go. When he's yep. old, he will not depart from it. Um, we've talked a little bit about, you know, the scrupulosity in OCD and your Christian mm-hmm. experience and sort of how that played into, you know, your core experience. Mm-hmm. But when you when you do come to where you are, where you've landed is where you've landed. And um, I, I think it's very important to say that it's okay to land where you landed. You don't have to deconvert. This is not about, you know, fundamentalist atheism. You know, we're not saying people need to be like us. You have deconstructed to the level that you're comfortable with, and that's great that you are where you are. You're thinking through it. You're looking for the toxicity, the the ways that this has abused people psychologically and even physically. On that note, I wanted to start to talk about Christians in general. So we're kind of focused, taking our focus off of us and more on fundamentalist evangelical Christianity. Why are Christians, by and large, so committed at the core to corporal punishment? Like, what is their mindset? What's why do they feel like? This isn't just my parents did it, so I'm going to do it. But there's like there's a theological commitment behind this. There's a theological commitment. And um, yeah, this when I first started doing this work, I did not anticipate speaking about corporal punishment, spanking as much as I have. Um, That was a kind of a discovery. I knew it was a core tenant. I had no idea how deeply rooted. And I hear from people all the time, whole range, people who've been excommunicated for refusing to spank, people who hear sermons series on the importance of spanking children. So it is beyond um, kind of a cultural thing. There is a core commitment there. And I think there's a number of reasons. I did a series, like 20 reasons. I think evangelical parents are the last holdouts uh, on corporal punishment. Um, And we can talk about some of them, but I think the theological commitment is it's deeply tied into ideas about sin and atonement that are at the same time very poorly defined and in another way very specifically defined. So by poorly defined, I mean when you read these resources and a lot of the work we do. So first let me say in our book, Kelsey and I were tracing the history and development of popular Christian parenting teaching really from Dobson onward. We go back a little further, but really from the 70s onward. And kind of looking at some of the common themes across these resources, because you begin to see them really quickly, um, be- and and considering what it means that these were sold, pitched to hundreds of thousands, probably millions of families as God's way to parent and God's way to raise a family. Um, and then what has been the impact of that on both adult children kind of looking back and trying to make sense, deconstructing or not trying to make sense of their childhood experiences and older parents who maybe are in a similar space looking back, um, how has it impacted family connection, all of that kind of thing. And we ended up uh, surveying and interviewing um, a number of people, kind of hearing some of their stories. And we also read a lot of the resources. So we tried to pick a lot of the really popular ones across the decades. And you begin to see recurrent themes. And one of them are these theological commitments. So uh, in many of the resources, sin is talked about in very generic catch-all kind of terms. Sin really becomes code for anything a parent doesn't like. Um, And because uh, instant obedience is often expected, uh, it can just be disobedience equals sin. And so it could be anything from your toddlers throwing food on the floor can become a sin issue um, to lying, what we might think of as more typically defined as a sin issue. So it becomes very vague, just this catch all. And because of that, it sets up a process of atonement needed. It doesn't make theological sense, even according to the metrics of the different frameworks that they're operating within. For instance, I'm sure you're 
viewers are probably familiar with penal substitutionary atonement. Yeah. But in short, it would be one motif of atonement that really pulls on like courtroom themes with an idea that there is um, uh, the wrath of God needs to be like directed to Jesus in order to atone for sin in a way that then does away with the wrath in short and brings forgiveness. So this, this kind of transactional uh, nature needs to happen. And you're going to find people who believe that is it, that is the gospel message. You will hear this like gospel coalition regularly produces articles that are like retributive punishment is crucial. Like it's a crucial part of the gospel. And you will find, I read a great book this year. It's called, I think the lamb lamb with a B lamb of the free um, an uh, Old Testament scholar who is making the case like this is not a concept. This is not a, a concept of the atonement we see in the Levitical system. So you get the whole range in Christian teaching, but in evangelical parenting teaching, it is just a given that that is the gospel. So can I, you can I ask? Yeah, just sure. For, for the sake of context, because I want to come right yeah. back to where, where we're going with this, yeah. but um, this is a very interesting side topic. If the if that's not the gospel to you, and that that was the gospel to me, I mean, obviously yeah. we could expand on it, but what is the gospel to you? Yeah. So I oh wow okay. <laughs> so I tend to think of when we're talking about atonement, I tend to think of all the motifs at once. But I think of this is going to sound well. I'll just sound wonky. This is going to sound wonky. My favorite theme, theme for the atonement, and I'll I'll mention it often in these conversations, is do you remember the the odd little story in Numbers? where um, uh, Moses needs to put a snake on a pole oh, yeah. because the snakes are coming through and everyone needs to look at the pole to be saved. It's it's a bizarre little story and disturbing little story. Um, but Jesus refers to that story, right? It says, when I am lifted up. And I think what I find so compelling about that is that is what he refers to. And there is not a transaction going on. There is this sense of like uh, salvation has been provided for those who who look. And so I resonate with the, that kind of model that's more, are you familiar with Christus Victor terminology? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So this idea that things have gone amiss in the world. These are not the way they're supposed to be. Um, this is, we know this in our own hearts. Our hearts are are divided. The line between good and evil runs through us all. We We do things to hurt others. We destroy our relationships, even when we mean well. Others hurt us and uh, we suffer. And then there's collective suffering. There's systematic suffering and injustice. Things are not well. And we we know this. We feel this. We long for it to be different. We long for eternity. Even as you said, we long for things to be put right. So I think of the gospel message is like the good news is that God himself came to put it right. And it's not a transactional um, message that he arbitrarily said he needed atonement in this way and then needed to provide, you know, and it's not the math that we try and do. Um, it is the when he decided to enter the story and reveal himself, it was in the person of Jesus. So I um, become fixated maybe more, hopefully not in an obsessive way, but on the gospels and what do we see in the gospels? of Jesus um, and how he's interacting with people, how he is engaging with the people who are suffering. Uh, I find it really compelling that the gospel writers talk about him being recognized by um, his wounds after his resurrection, uh, that he understands the human condition and enters in. So anyway, I find the whole story of salvation, redemption, history to be a compelling, compelling presentation of the gospel is the good news is we're welcome. Mm -hmm. I can't imagine that some Christians yeah. aren't, aren't aren't absolutely crucifying you for that perspective. <laughs> really? I mean, I know I that I, in my I the circles know. I would have been, and they would have they would have said that's that's ridiculous. Um, I mean, right. I would have obviously at this point. I don't care about any of it, but right. um, it's 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 just fascinating because there are so many verses that talk about him being the substitute for our sins. I mean, let me ask this: Do you, I'm just going back here a step to, and we'll come back to the to sure, the Christian sure. punishment, but. Do you, would you use the word sin? Like, would you call your, did you tell your kids they're sinners? Um, so I use the word sin. I do not tell my kids they're sinners, right? Okay. Like I understand the concept of sin. Um, something I do like to talk a lot about, and we can, if you want to, I think it's super problematic when um, 
people catechize their young children into that language. I think it's problematic for all the reasons you and probably your viewers know firsthand because it becomes, it can become an form of indoctrination. It can, it can be spiritually abusive no matter what the parent is intending, because these are concepts that are not age appropriate for young children, I think. Um, And it also, it's a, it does, it's not respectful in a certain way because they're not able to choose. (laughs) They're not able to choose that. And I think it's rare that it's done in a way that respects their agency. I, I do think there are ways to do that because I think children are spiritual beings. I think when we see Jesus engage children, yeah, the parents bring the young children to Jesus, but they engage with Jesus directly. So I think it's it's less uh, indoctrination. So anyway, so I would not use that language particularly. Well, how about just for, for you, for you personally, like, would you say, I, w- I am a sinner in need of a savior? Would you agree with that? Um, yeah, I would say that. Yeah. And do, what do you think happens if you don't receive Jesus as your savior? I wouldn't use the language. I wouldn't necessarily use the language of receive Jesus right. as my savior, but, but I know believe in him. Mean, trust but him. I know no, in other words, where, in other words, where am I going when I die? Marissa? <laughs> oh gosh. Is it really hot? <laughs> no, I, I mean, I think, and this, this will get me in trouble with people. <laughs> I think there's a wideness in God's mercy. I think when he says he's going to put it all to right, I think he's going to put it all to right. And I think if we have an infinity of years to do that, then that's okay. And if I'm, I, again, I also feel like some of it kind of doesn't matter what I think if, if this is true, it's going to be what it's going to be. <laughs> but I tend to think I'm all in on grace in that sense. And if it is his kindness and mercy for the world that God so loved the world, then that's everybody. And it sort will of a love, get love wins, sort of a love wins a perspective. Bit, a little bit. Um, but I know that that is unsatisfactory for many. I understand that, but yeah. I'm okay. I'm comfortable with it. And, and <laughs> I'm, I'm definitely not debating you because again, from my perspective, obviously yeah. it's, it's all. And I'm not trying to like convince, but I'm happy to answer your questions. Yeah. I just also, I'll, I'll trust you to lead the conversation for what your viewers may want to hear or what yeah. might. Well, it's, it's just interesting because it, I don't know. <laughs> it's, it's, it's fascinating to me how there is such a wide variety of people who approach this. And so even like when I give the caveat to people who are watching, like, hey, we're about to in- interview a Christian, that obviously from our conversation right now, that means a lot of different things to people. Yeah. And, uh, you know, for example, even there's, there are Christians, I interviewed a Christian recently named April Adjoy. Do you know that name? Oh, yeah, yeah. I heard book just came out. Yeah, yeah. her book just came right. out. And she's, you know, she's very much against Christian nationalism. I'm not sure mm-hmm. we, we didn't clarify what else she might be against, but you know, she's those those Christians who would crucify her for that. Like, you know, Christ yeah. is king and we need to make him king of our society. Sure. What in the world a part of Christianity don't you get? Right. And yet she's very, you know, her Christian Christianity is very different. Yours is very different from other people's. Um, it's just fascinating yeah. the the wide well, variety of it. And there's well, we and could this is, go on yeah, and on about we the could talk forever. But this is for me the key of studying church history is like I I take my faith seriously, but myself not so much, in the sense that. I do think all Christians are little heretics. So the idea that we would um, sit in such a position of certainty that would, you know, degrade another human being or pass judgment in these kind of severe ways. I think we have a long and violent, bloody history that should, at the very least, tell us to take a pause. You know, like there are people who were killing other Christians for things like the way they took the Eucharist. So I think I do think about these things. I have a master's Mm -hmm. in theology. I study church history. I love all these things. But gosh, a lot of people had a lot of certainty and got a lot of things wrong. So I think there's a tension there to be held. So anyway, yeah, all the more when you're talking about teaching that to a younger generation, right? Humility. I think needs to be a huge piece in any kind of catechesis. And unfortunately in the kind of resources, most evangelical families were given, there's very little humility. And instead you have people saying, I literally, quite literally, I speak with the voice of God. Mm. And if you don't do this, not only will 
you fail, like you will have disobeyed God, but very bad things will happen to your children, right? There's a lot of fear mongering. Yes, the eternal stakes are there, but also there's, you read Dobson's books, there's a ton of fear mongering about how their lives will be go poorly. Every Whatever the social ill and social fear of the moment is, that's what will happen unless you follow these formulas, which I think for a lot of people, parenting, becoming new parents is a really vulnerable time. You don't know. You know, there's a lot of trust um, in these authority figures. They're speaking with the voice of God. It's very understandable that devout people want to please God. I think new parents and new converts are particularly vulnerable to these teachings. Um, spoke with a number of people who were parents were new Christians when they became parents. So all they know is they don't want to maybe repeat their own childhood. So someone hands Mm -hmm. them Dobson's book, right? Mm -hmm. What do they know? They're new Christian, new parent. They, they take it now to be fair. There are, there were a fair number of Christians who were able to read these resources and like the woman in my Bible study, rip it apart and throw it in the trash. There, there were people who were able to be like, no, I'm not going to do that. So um, I don't, I don't mean to paint, Parents as all not having agency here. Many of them knew knew what they were doing. And in fact, many of these teachings, I think, attract abusive people because it offers them power. But um, yeah, so lots of people stuck in it. Okay, back to the atonement theories. (laughs) So what you see weirdly in these books is sin as a catch-all, lip service being given to this idea of the gospel as Jesus died for our sins. And yet children still need to atone for their sins via corporal punishment. Like that is this very odd logical aberration there because why is not even by that framework, which, which I reject that framework, but even with the logical consistency of that framework, why is Jesus's atonement not enough? Um, And it's not. So in these books, they really present spanking as um a means of like almost a okay almost a liturgy like a necessary ritual and so you have two kind of different ways corporal punishment shows up one is more dobson style often which is more utilitarian i think it's kind of what you saw in american culture frankly in the 70s and 80s i think it's very much wrapped in to like america's love affair of violence and criminal retributive punishment it's all connected um but it's kind of like that the the language used is that child's asking for a spanking or needs a spanking or there's this idea that that's really how you get compliance and that that's a good thing so you have that strain and then you have the strain of thought that there's that really presents it as no there's something particularly godly about spanking your child like if you don't do that you are not Loving. I think Doug Wilson says, like, um, God requires people to inflict pain on those they love. So it becomes really wrapped up with these distorted messages about love. It's incredibly, I mean, it's in the moment abusive and it's incredibly short sighted because it functionally catechizes children to love means pain. Love means someone can inflict pain on my body because God told them to um, what, love. Do you feel like at that point that they're associating love with the pain in some kind of weird twisted sense that like, if, if, if they truly love me, they're going to do this. I mean, even the Bible sure. talks about, you know, father punishes his, his child. Um, For sure. Just that sense of if, if you were to let them go, uh, sort of the spare the rods, spare the rods, spoil the child. Like right. if you were to just let them get away with this, let them get away with murder, uh, proverbially that you're actually, you, you're actually showing them that you hate them. You you need to give them a little sure. tough love to go back to Dobson, give them tough yeah. love, but it's actually the more loving thing to be tough with them. For sure. And you'll, anytime I talk about this online, like the comments will usually explode with people still defending Spain. Like this is the hill. Some people want to die on is defending corporal punishment. Right. And they will sort of say that, that of like, no, this is how you show love. I think it, um, you talk to adult children who were spanked frequently um, or even not even frequently. I mean, this is where I will 
and I will directly tell Christian parents, and just in case any are listening here, I'll say it, like the Bible does not require you to spank your children. There's not something particularly Christian about this. Um, please stop doing it. It is not a help to children in any, in any way. And um, there's a lot of evidence we now have set aside this research-based evidence that shows harm just listen to the adults who experienced this and you hear any number of things. Many mark it as grooming. It groomed them for future abuse. Makes so much sense because a spiritual authority figure to, can take them somewhere, do something to their body, said, God wants this, you know, we need to reconcile. They mark it as what enabled them to accept abusive behavior in their relationships because they came to expect that, that people who loved them would hurt them or be able to tell them it's for your own good that I do this, to kind of expect that being wrapped up. Many connect it to self-harm, like they couldn't feel forgiven or right unless they felt pain in their bodies. Many connect it to, many will talk about feeling as young children unwanted sexual arousal. And so they will connect it to different experiences and problems they experience sexually as an adult. Um, and so there's any number of, and and there's probably more. Those are the four I hear the most. And it's really a gamble. Like you don't know as a parent, if you set down that path, whether your child might be one. I also hear from adults who say, look, I was spanked and it it wasn't a big deal. Like it didn't have that kind of impact on me. So maybe, but maybe not. Maybe there are these exponential consequences and for what, you know, for something that's not even a particularly um, effective parenting tool. So um, the liturgized spanking, that's what I call the ritualistic, where where, you, where parents are told in these manuals, like these seven steps, and it's very wrapped up in prayer. Like you need to pray with your child. You need to hug your child after it, all this kind of stuff. Um, I think there's a level of spiritual abuse here that needs to be reckoned with. But also even just the utilitarian kind of spank your kid to get him to obey is also problematic uh, because all of this comes with high, high, high emphasis on instant unquestioning obedience, which is problematic for a number of reasons, let alone as we probably, and anyone listening in this podcast is going to immediately see the connection. Like, is this really where you want is this really preparing a child for adulthood? Is this really where you want to go? Instant unquestioning obedience. And I would say in some high control religious groups, that is the end game. Um, Can I ask a question yeah. on that note? When sure. you look at at a lot of Christians, and I, when I say this, I'm, I'm very much pointing the finger back at myself uh, in sure. shame because I certainly did, uh, you know, when I was a Christian, I certainly did spank my children. Mm. Uh, but just talking about the mentality that's yeah. that's behind it all um, that I did adopt, and I know many other Christians did. The idea is that you're you're training their will, you're often even breaking their will, but it's not just an issue of I need to break your will so that you will obey me as your as your earthly parent. But this is in some ways a training ground because there is a bigger parenthood at stake. And just like I need you to eventually you know, want to, in quotes, I want, I need you to want to voluntarily say, you know, I will obey gladly, quickly from the heart with no talk back. And I'm, I'm, I'll mean it, but I'll do it with a smile on my face. I'll be a very shiny, happy person. And you, you need to understand how to do that on the human relationships, because there's a much bigger connection. If, if you can't break your will here in this little teeny microcosm of relationship, how in the world are you going to break your, your own will before God? When God says, I demand that you submit. I demand that you be you humble yourself in the sight of the Lord. If you can't humble yourself in the sight of your father or your mother, how can you humble yourself in the sight of the Lord? And that connection, and you mentioned before, you're kind of like taking a godlike perspective of like you're kind of God to your children, but it really is that connection. Like, and if you don't, if you don't, you are going to be basically put do this to your children. You're going to be putting them on the path of this this autonomy which is sort of you know that's a another word that i think some christians might crucify us for mm -hmm. but you're putting them on this path of saying it's all about how do you feel about it and you know they maybe would talk about oh this is this new psychology and new 
all these new studies, like we don't need these new studies, you know, going back to new aesthetic counseling, we don't need new studies and secular ideas and psychology, we need the word of God. And so they're going to ignore all that and just call it, you know, some kind of uh, syrupy nonsense. And they're not going to put any value to it. And they're going to say, there's, there's, there's one big issue. There's only one big issue. What's your relationship with God? And your relationship with God does not start with, I just feel loved by God. Your first response should be, I have fear and reverence God and I honor and obey him. And when you look in the Bible, there are a lot of verses where the Yahweh character, I mean, this is going more to my channel's perspective, Mm -hmm. and I don't want to make it look like this is yours, but that the Yahweh character is extremely, repeatedly, overwhelmingly psychopathic. And he basically says, you know, I, I want a loving relationship with you. I will love you to the nth degree, and I will bless every bit of, of your life if you will do it my way. But if you don't, I will beat the shit out of you. I mean, he literally says at one point, if you disobey me, I'll make you so, uh, punish you so bad, you will want to eat your own children. He says in another place, if you disobey me, I will literally, uh, or metaphorically lift your skirts up in front of your enemies and show them your nakedness. Like, that's your good, good father that you're going to sing about in your worship songs. That's the good, good father. I mean, that's a psychopath. If he did did it in real life, he'd be in prison. Um, and so I think there's a lot of us that are deconstructing and, and deconverting are saying, this isn't just that there's psychological, uh, you know, really good reasons to stop hitting children. It's, it's also that this is, this is based on a much bigger theological construct. And if you don't, if you don't in some way break that, you can't like Christians aren't, there's obviously going to be progressive Christians. They're just going to go with the culture in some way, but there's going to be Christians who are going to say, we don't care about the way the culture goes. The culture is going to swing back and forth with the wind. We don't want the, the, the swaying. We want the foundation of the bedrock word of God. And the word of God does not tell us to look to secular psychology. It says, get your child to revere you so that you can train them to revere their heavenly father. Otherwise, you're literally saying, I don't really care that much about your very soul for eternity. You've, I mean, do you feel like that's kind of what people are going with it, where they're going with it? I think some people, yeah, I think that's fair. I think that's why it's so compelling then when they hear a spiritual authority figure, pastor, teacher type person saying, here's the way to get it right. And make sure your child Ted Tripp uses the circle of blessing and Gothard has his umbrellas. They all have these metaphors of like, here's how you know you're in doing it right. Um, because there is a fear-based motivation. Um, and I think, yeah, that's a core tenet of it that you, you'll hear it directly in the resources where they will say, you teach your child to obey instantly right away and without and cheerfully um, and all the way, instantly right away, all the way. There's different versions of that so that they can learn to do that with, with God. Um, and a lot of the resources in doing that, uh, they f- they functionally put a parent in the role of God, almost like a demigod. <laughs> and um, Ted Tripp will say this directly, and others will th- say this directly, like, you are an agent of God. When a child disobeys you, they disobey God. So this is problematic theological implications, one of which it essentially rewrites God after our own image. And I would say, as someone who is a Christian, a person of faith, I would say this is, uh, there's a lot of indirect catechesis going on in these teachings, because so much is being done in God's name, that both directly and indirectly, a child walks away. And often there's so much Christian word salad coming with these things too, like these big theological concepts are thrown around, even in this parenting scripts, parents are being offered. They walk away with a sense of this is what God is like. He is waiting to catch me when I screw up. If I haven't, if I've disobeyed and I haven't obeyed right away, all the way with a happy heart, he's there. He's right there with a swift retributive punishment for me to get me back in line because he cares most about my performance. And um, this becomes an exhausting spiritual treadmill. A lot of, I think, people who still want to hold on to their faith discover that they have been um, really set on a treadmill of legalism in a number of different ways, even if those words would not, those theological words would not come from these teachers. They would say, well, but it's the gospel alone. Um, And I think this is why corporal punishment to get back to it is so deeply embedded because I do think, I think of it as a house of cards a little bit. 
if you pull out that card, the whole thing becomes to wobble because, well, if it's not fear of punishment, what's the reason to obey? You know, like, and so for the Christian parent, particularly, they're often not just given these erroneous tools, that there's also an absence of other tools. So what what are they going to do if they don't have spanking in their back pocket, right? How will their children obey? Now, if you are outside of that way of parenting, you discover there are a number of other approaches you can take to parent, uh, but compliance isn't necessarily the t- topmost goal, right? Or good behavior isn't necessarily the topmost goal. It's it's connecting with your child. It's helping your child regulate. I mean, there are other parenting goals, but that in itself requires its own kind of deconstruction and also raises, I think, uncomfortable questions for people about faith then too. Like, well, why am I o- obeying God? Is it just fear of punishment? If if he didn't need to do that, if, if he doesn't need atonement, what does that mean? And so I think there's some resistance to that because it's a, a fear of what else might be lost um, instead of the kind of certainty of these frameworks. Um, and unfortunately, what happens is I think day in and day out, parents can train themselves as well in how they're interacting such that 20 years down the road, they have trained themselves in expecting compliance, expecting obedience, expecting alignment, and left themselves bereft with other tools such that when maybe adult children say, hey, I'm not, I'm leaving the faith or I'm going to a different denomination, or I met someone and I'm moving or whatever it may be, um, it can be intolerable. Like a child's autonomy can be intolerable because that was Mm. never perceived as a good, right? It was uh, in some ways, um, a lot of the parenting techniques offered in these books uh, cultivate narcissistic parenting, where children are just extensions of the parent, whether they're perceived as like arrows for culture war purposes or a good testimony to help convert other people or just to be a blessing, whatever it may be, there's there's different language used. They're not seen as beloved individuals worthy yeah. of dignity, worthy of autonomy with their own God-given personalities, you know, they're seen as an extension. So then um, there's no capacity to really cultivate that in them and say, well, what what do you think? What will you choose? I wonder what what you will decide. I, I love how you keep using the word yeah. autonomy. Yeah. That's just that's been such a big deal to me because that that was one of the biggest immediate connections for me when I deconverted mm-hmm. was mm-hmm. I immediately, I mean, almost literally immediately overwhelmingly respected my children's thought autonomy mm-hmm. and i was like I, they don't have to believe like me they did they didn't have to believe like me when i was a christian they don't have to not believe like me now that i'm an atheist mm-hmm. it's it's saying this is your journey i respect you know I, I i will certainly pass on to you my worldview and share share what, what my journey has been like and why i've landed where i've landed but it's it's your journey and i'll respect you just like you would also respect their sexuality and say you know i'm i'm not gay but if, if you end up in your journey finding out that you are gay, I will respect your sexuality and your journey. And in the same way, once you once you start crossing those bridges of thought autonomy, it's it's really hard to not immediately connect and say, if I'm going to put that much respect on your mind, how can I not also put that much respect on your body? And and especially when you bring in adults, like I wouldn't force an adult to say, you all have to believe like me right. in a in a conversation. And also I wouldn't say you all disappointed me. So I'm going to, you know, go to another adult and start paddling them. Mm-hmm. You just, you don't do that with adults and to, to transfer it to children and say, I, I can't respect you in your, in your minds it, with your, with your mind and your thoughts and, and, and disrespect you so heavily with your body. And I wanted to ask you about just one of the related word that comes to mind a lot these days, yeah. unfortunately for my personal situation, but the word torture, mm-hmm. this is relating to the gospel. You know, when you look at a child, especially like in the Catholic Church, where they literally see these icons and they and they yeah. see this this Jesus on the cross, he's uh, yeah. you know maybe he's got the crown of thorns and the blood running down. Or yeah. in my my experience, it was not uh, the the statues; it was more pictures in a in a, in a book. 
uh, for you know typical evangelicalism, but you see, you know, Jesus was tortured for you, and you get the message that you are so bad that yes. someone had to literally not just die, but but die a violent, bloody death. You had to be yeah. tortured for you. That's how wicked you were. How how much yeah. it cost. But then when you look at a, a, a spanking. And you, you kind of alluded to this a little bit where you said, you know, didn't Jesus atonement cover your sins? Mm-hmm. Even as a child, you know, why is spanking the new punishment? But if you were to spank a child forever, it would eventually kill them. If, if you yeah. were to. And it if has. You were to, I mean, parents have killed their children. Spanking. Yeah. But I mean, it's, it's, it's basically 100%. like spanking is a, is a, is a small, is a mini torture. Yeah. If you were, if you were to, um, you know, say it's just a you know, simple spanking of you've got a paddle and you're paddling their butt, you know, you, you could, you could hit them. Uh, a thousand times and kill them. You could just, you know, if you had some big monster guy that's, you know, 200 pounds with a great swing, he could probably kill him in one, one, one big hit. You know, this is a version of, of mini torture. And yeah. you're kind of saying just like the father felt like he needed to have his own son tortured to pay for the sins of the world. Right. You have a, a mini torture to go through because you're, we're, we're, we're talking about paying, you know, paying for sins here. And like you alluded to, you know, Jesus's death obviously doesn't really pay for your sins because he was tortured, but you still need to have this little micro torture. Yeah. But just connecting that word torture to the idea that you you can't be like tortured like someone would be in, say, in a, in a war zone experience. You can't be tortured without going through incredible PTSD. You, you're going to look at the idea of this long-term anxiety or depression. Uh, you're going to see people that are they're struggling with co- chronic stress and even health issues their emotional awareness, their hypervigilance. Um, how, how do you, do you feel like Christians can see that this really is a micro version of torture and that they're, they're accept, they're willing to accept it because their, their arch hero, the father was so willing to torture his child. And it was such a good outcome. The torture did was hit their torture was the salvation of the world. Your micro torture that I'm going to do on you, little Johnny is going to save your life from being a criminal. Do you, do you feel yeah. like they're connecting those dots? Um, I think some are. I think for most, it's presented to them uh, erroneously, I believe. But as here are some proverbs that talk about the rod, that means you need to spank your toddler. Like most of them are getting that message alongside a heavy dose of obedience is the highest good. Um, and that's that can be really motivating for parents separate no matter what context, because there can be a lot of shaming of parents for children's, you know, just societally. So parents are motivated, like they're embarrassed if their child's like acting out or something. So um, there's some internal motivation. I think when you combine all those things, I think a lot of parents don't question it, right? Some just go with it, particularly if that's what's happening in their community. Um also, some communities like, yeah, the pastor's preaching this from the pulpit. It's made into this very big deal. And so in that sense, parents have to obey too. Like they can't, like I mentioned, I've heard from some who've been excommunicated or asked to leave or kind of shut out of their communities because they have not chosen to spank their children, you know, which some of that is ge- regional, seems to be regional. Like I hear from a lot of people in the South where it's still like Texas in particular, I've heard from a number of parents where it's just like, yeah, everybody at my church spanks their children. Like this is normative. Um, whereas I think in in the region I'm at, I'm, I'm sure there are, but I would, I would say that's not culturally acceptable uh, in the same way. So there's some regional differences anyway. And certainly this is a, I would say an American phenomenon. I hear from European Christians who are horrified, you know, they say, no, it's illegal in our country to begin with. So this is the only time we see it is when it's exported from America, you know, and I hear from, I've heard from uh, Christians globally. I heard from a Dalit Christian and a Christian in Malaysia who was talking, who were both talking about how this was exported from America, this kind of family life teaching and how it causes immense problems when it combines with maybe an already patriarchal culture. Um, it it reinforces things that, from a Christian perspective, the the gospel would be undoing. <laughs> you know these kind of hierarchies. So anyway, um, yeah. So I think some maybe are doing that math, but I think a lot of them are on autopilot. I think for those who begin to question, the people I hear the most from who begin to question, uh, 
either go through a foster to adoption type training and they discover other tools. And that's like a huge light bulb moment where they realize I don't have to do this. <laughs> you know, like they're other, they're equipped with other tools. And I also tragically, I hear from many who it just doesn't work. And then they discover their child is neurodivergent or something else, something else that is, is making it harder for the child to comply. Um, and so they found themselves escalating because that's really the only, th- if corporal punishment is your primary tool and if obedience is the God, God approved end, it will escalate if a child doesn't comply, right? Like that's the math. It's incredibly dangerous. It's incredibly irresponsible. It makes me very angry to think of pastors and teachers and people who made lots of money off these books continuing to preach this message when that is some of the fruit of it. Um, but they often they will realize this isn't working and they will they will find a different way. But I think that also really underscores how vulnerable children are because plenty of parents won't question. They won't listen to the discomfort they're feeling, uh, particularly if they're in environments where they're told to mistrust their feelings and their own autonomy and to say, God knows better than you do. Trust his word, which says the right, you know, they will maybe not listen to that check. That's like, what am I doing here? Um, And so, yeah. Do you see a difference at all between men and women in these Christian circles, like, is it, are, are there, and I know some of this may not be an, a question you can answer, but either in terms of your, your studies and your reading or just anecdotally, do you get the sense that there are more men pushing these narratives of we need to control these children or else they're going to turn into little rebe- rebels to us and ultimately God. And yeah. and they're more willing to stick with this, the, this, this party line. And I would imagine that, uh, you know, a woman's natural empathy and tenderness towards her, her child's heart might lead her to say, maybe we should rethink this. Or does does it feel like if it's, if you're in that church, you're in that church, you're going to, it's not going to make a difference. Equal opportunity, honestly, like I hear from um, women who want to find an alternate way and maybe their husband is all in, particularly when you get into corners of the church that are really dominionist or hierarchy oriented. Um, But there are plenty of women who are all in those ideologies as well, you know, and there are plenty of women who bring their husbands into those ideologies, right, because they want that. So I think it's I think it's pretty equal opportunity. Um, Interestingly, the resources themselves used to be primarily produced by men, like. Honestly, very poorly qualified people, right? Like Dobson out of all of them probably has the most qualifications just because he was a psychologist, even though he later renounced that association. Most of these people, once you look at their credentials, they don't have any, right? Like maybe they're a pastor, which doesn't necessarily bring qualifications. Most of them brought wrote these books when their own children were very young. So it's not even like they bring a lot of parenting experience. And it started mostly with men. We we see that pivoting in the past 10 to 20 years, particularly with influencer culture. And so now you have women, a lot of women producing resources. Um, so yeah, and I think there's a spectrum, right? Like there are, there's the corners where where this is, you know, I hear from people who there are churches where the church has a spanking room for children to be spanked during service. I mean, it's awful, awful um, how normalized it is in some communities. So you have that extreme. And then I think you have people who are kind of like half-hearted about it or kind of have a line where they say, well, I reserve that for when it's really bad. Like, so my child won't run in the street or something. Like that's often what people will say. And then obviously you have people who've actively rejected it. And I do think the internet has helped uh, with that end. I think people are discovering different resources. There are a couple of well-known Christian influencer accounts or or books coming out saying, "Here, here are some alternate perspectives. And I do think as millennials began parenting, many of them, particularly those raised in this, said, no, we won't be redoing that. Even people within the church, like we won't be replicating that. But there are still many who do. So, I asked it, there, there's 
there's a lot of people that talk these days about purity culture. Mm. And uh, I'm not going to take us down that path, but just to use it as a, a quick illustration of something. You know, when you when you look at the way that maybe a, a, a young girl might be encouraged to wear a purity ring or sign a mm-hmm. pledge to her daddy. And then, of course, you know, during the wedding, you know, who gives this you know woman away her, her you know, the, the father and mother do. But it's like a woman in many ways is seen as property. You, you belong yeah. to your daddy and now you're belonging to your husband. And of course, that can come out and especially in ultra patriarchal societies is like you, there's no such thing as marital rape. You know, if, if you're married, um, you know, like Nancy Wilson would say, you know, man is never trespassing in his own garden. Um, yeah. that, that She's his property. In a yeah. similar sense, it seems like going back to autonomy and, you know, a child's rights, that a child is in many ways seen as your property. As opposed to just your yeah. responsibility, you know, you're there to guide them, you're there to shepherd them, you're there to obviously take care of them, feed them, clothe them, and help them with with growing up. But th- they're also yours, like they're your property. Okay. And do you feel like that that mentality of, um, especially in purity culture, where this this you know teenage girl and her virginity is truly seen as like the daddy's property? Do you think that that's weaving into this too? I think so. I think some will directly say it. Like Doug Wilson, you've mentioned, he talks about generational faithfulness. A lot of these guys talk about this, like the idea being the choices the parents make, they can expect it to have certain results in generations. So there's very much a sense of like, we're setting the path for generations. Um, And yeah, ownership is a good word for it. And in some ways, this historically speaking, this isn't new, right? Like for most of human history, Children have been viewed as property. Women and children and enslaved people kind of are non-persons. And something we talk a little bit about in the book, how um, a lot of the uh, Christian hierarchy we see in these models is based on Roman household codes, right? Of the the father and then the, the woman and then the child. And in that sense, there's a non-personhood. Um, just from the beginning. And I think a lot of the language surrounding that, the aspirations, because I think all this kind of stuff gets very murky, right? Because um, there are plenty of well-intentioned parents, but as we all know, intention doesn't mitigate impact necessarily, but there are people caught up in this with good intentions. They, They have aspirations and hopes for their children or what they perceive would be a good life for them. Um, particularly when there are eternal stakes involved, what they want to protect them from or, or help them get on the right path that they should go. But I think the lie, originally we called our book Lies, Christian Parents Believed, uh, but um, I think the lie is that they they are omnipotent and have that power. And I think that's a lie that'll carry parents for a long way because to a certain extent, when children are very young, parents are in an omnipotent role, right? They They do control almost every aspect of a child's life. And, and you see this in isolated subcultures like homeschooling, you, you kind of see this kind of stuff writ large. There's like no intervention. There's, there's no um, safety net even. So um, a certain point though, the receipt comes due. And um, the question is what, what do parents do when they realize that they are not omnipotent gods, that they couldn't control the outcome? or that this didn't work out the way they hoped. And um, unfortunately, I think many have a defensive fragility for that. I do hear from some who have the capacity to listen and pivot, but many and many are just very confused because they believed these promises and were betrayed by them. It didn't work out the way it was supposed to work out, right? Like they did all the things. <laughs> they grew their kids God's way and it didn't work out. And um the experts, there's very little accountability for the experts, right? They continue to pitch this stuff to a new generation, unfortunately. Yeah, I, I grew up with people that were probably, I don't know for sure of this as a fact, but they were probably reading the Pearls. Uh, was, it Mike, yeah. was it Michael and Debbie Pearl? Or, Michael and Debbie, yeah. Um, and it's, uh, probably the, some of the Ted Tripp stuff. I, and mm-hmm. I think Elizabeth Elliott was probably a big factor yeah. in some of these. I grew up heavily under John MacArthur, and I know he's, okay. that's not his main factor, but I know that he's probably touched on some of these things too. Oh, he's and, written parenting. Yeah, because this is also the flip, right? Like if a pastor has enough influence, they'll just write on any topic, right? And and MacArthur's a good example of where all these things it's like, what angle do you want to come at it? But when they get tangled up, they get so insidious because MacArthur's whole 
uh, nuthetic mindset that there's no psychology, frankly, you know, where he's like, there are not there. I don't know if you saw his recent thing, like there's no ADHD, there's no OCD, there's no PTSD, you know, this whole camp that kind of effectively gaslights people to sort of say, no, the only thing is try harder to be perfect essentially is really the option given to people like try harder to just do, do it all right. That is really passed on to children and it's not sustainable. Obviously it, it's not sustainable. So I suspect mm-hmm. that there are a lot of people within and outside the church, but even within experiencing painful repercussions of this, whether that's estrangement, whether that's inauthentic connection, whether that's performative relationships or, or heavy uh, expectations. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I think one of the most amazing things about uh, this, and I, I know we've talked for a while, I'll have just a few final questions and we'll re- bring it to a wrap up soon. But yeah. one of the most amazing parts of this to me is that when you get through the process of saying, number one, I, I was wrong, I made wrong mm-hmm. choices and I need to correct this path. I need to apologize. And I have, I've apologized to my kids for uh, ever spanking them. I've apologized to my kids for ever teaching them that they were sinners. I've apologized to them for, uh, for teaching them about Jesus and the, and the Bible. I've apologized for all of it um, repeatedly. But one of the things, as you begin to settle into that and realize that you're, you're, you're like nothing's going to be the same ever again in your mindset. Your worldview is entirely shifted. And one of the most beautiful parts of this is you begin to to, to sort of reparent yourself, and you say, mm-hmm. "What would I have needed to thrive as a child?" And therefore, I can't obviously recover my time as a child. But what can I do differently? And and you just you just in a very simplistic general sense you start to see the world through their eyes and you think, do I want to put my kids in a fight or flight mode? Do I want to make their heart race? Do I want to make them hyper vigilant, hyper anxious? Do I yeah. want to make them you know get to a point where they want to give me a facade of like I'm a good little you know good little kid mm-hmm. and I'll obey? But it's just a facade inside. They're they're saying screw you you know in their childhood yeah. language. They're saying I'm not I'm, I'm obeying on the outside but not on the inside. Do you want that? Do you want them to fear you? And I, I know that you know, there's there's always ways in which we can go to extremes with this, and you can just become the the, the licentious parent that's like, I'm just going to let my kid do whatever they want. If they want to break the glass and break the mirrors in the house, I don't care. Like I know we there's always extremes of people that go way too far with this, but to just in a general sense to say, my child uh, needs empathy. My child needs me to see what they're going through. And like you said, there could be even uh, you know ADHD or autism things, mental health issues, there are stresses. Like for example, my kids right now, they're going through an incredible amount of stress for a lot of reasons. And most of my viewers know, know, know that story. But when I look at them now, when they misbehave, I do not frame it in my mind as like they're misbehaving. I think to myself, I wonder in what way they're struggling with the, the overall situation or they're struggling with maybe something that happened at school today. Or just the just the realities of growing up, you know. The the other day I was at my kids' uh, school. They had a for Halloween. They had a thing where they were they were marching around in costumes, and I went to see it. And my my oldest son, who's nine, he he just looked as awkward as could be. He was like, what? he didn't have a costume. I guess he didn't want one, and he was just walking around with his head down, like he was like awkward and uncomfortable with the whole thing. And I thought to myself, that's that's this where he's at right now. That's where he's he's a pre preteen. He, he's learning to be, uh, you know, learning like sort of the, the inside out movie. If you've seen that, he's, he's yeah, learning I love where those. he, yeah, I love those movies, but he's learning to be himself. He's learning to figure out who he is and how to be safe in his own skin. And to realize that for a lot of us growing up, we were not safe in our own skin yeah. on, on many levels, both generically, as well as with our thought lives. And, and, yeah. and especially knowing in terms of Christian theology, that our parents were kind of trying to control not just our bodies and our actions and our words, but our, our very thoughts. And yeah. that we believe that God was seeing in our thoughts and judging us and controlling our thoughts, sort of that celestial North Korea. And to believe that you're under that much surveillance and that much judgment. And someone's always just, you're, you're one second away from someone saying, you're, I am so disappointed in you. Shame, shame, shame. And the next word out of their mouth is you're going to get it. And then they do get it. And to think, that yeah. that was my childhood. How did that feel? And how can I do it differently for them? And it it just it gives you more empathy and respect 
for the, mm-hmm. even just for the human experience to say, yes. what would a child need? What would a human child need to really thrive, to be like, wow, like this is just, this is a, this isn't a perfect childhood. There's not always enough money to, to do all the things we want to do. There's not, you know, Christmas sometimes doesn't look very good, whatever, but you know what? It was still magical because I had so much love for my parents and so much yeah. respect. And I, I truly felt safe in my bed at night. I didn't feel like somebody was going to come and pull the blanket off and whack me. Right. Um, and it's just, you know, that, that respect, it's, it just, it goes to the roof at a certain point where you just think, I just, I want to respect your human journey. I want to yeah. respect your autonomy. And it's just, it's a beautiful thing to switch. And it's, it's not yeah. like you, you suddenly become a perfect parent. We all, have, it's a learning curve, but it's just, it, yeah. it just, it radically changes you it's, and you, it, yeah. you see yourself in their eyes a little bit. It's a paradigm shift. And I think it's an invitation, right? Yeah. To reparent ourselves. I think that is incredibly challenging to do while parenting young children, because I think, especially for people who grew up in harmful environments, parenting children can trigger that, right? Like if it's unsafe to, if it was unsafe growing up to talk back to a parent, then when your own child talks back to you, that's going to trigger like a instinct of So it can, it can take a lot of work, right? Like I think good therapy, good help, good support. Uh, but there's an invitation there. And I think similarly for those people who still retain faith, there can be an invitation to a paradigm shift to say, what if, for instance, God tr- was drawing near out of empathy in the incarnation rather than to pounce, you know, in understanding, you know, so I do think in the same way that all these things trickle down from theology for those who are uh, who are untangling or wanting to retain faith it can become an invitation to reframe that relationship as well because that metaphor is there right though i find it so interesting this is something i will say often um all these books have been written right all these christian books so many christian books have been written and the bible actually has very little to say about parenting to Christians, like as particularly to Christians, very little. There are two verses in the New Testament directed to parents, and they are, fathers, do not provoke your children to anger or embitter them. One is bring them up in the instruction, followed up by bring them up in the instruction of the Lord. So a lot of times I'll point that out because tomes and tomes have been written, even though really all the one anothering verses of the New Testament, the Children are our littlest neighbors, right? Like this idea that we love our neighbors, children are our littlest neighbors, but these teachings are so absent from the resources being sold to parents. Like, and it's it's market. I think I have 80 books on my shelf, Christian parenting books. One even has Jesus in the title. Most of them do not talk about Jesus. Most of them talk about doctrinal concepts that are pre-interpreted, right? And that's presented as Christianity. Um, a few do better jobs than others, but most of them, but people will will just be given it, the word of mouth, like that Bible study I went to, it's just what the small group at your church is studying. So that's what you're going to do. And so there's a lot of trust involved. Um, but I find that really interesting. And I also find it really interesting that for Christians, in case there are Christians listening or, or people in some stage of deconstruction. I think it's so interesting that um, when Jesus chooses to tell a story about a father, it's a pretty, by these terms, passive and inept father. It's a father who hands over the inheritance to the son who's going to squander it. And that's it. like we, by all these books, that father has failed. Like he has failed to bring up his kid in the right way. He's a pushover. And but in, in that story, the father is interested in both the sons, both the son who returns and the son who is angry that he's so forgiving. And I find that really compelling and powerful when I think about parenting. We do not, neither Kelsey or, nor I, offer parenting advice or set ourselves up to do that for a lot of reasons. One being We see how easily so many people have done that. We have no interest in doing that. That's not our training. But um, a lot of times I will direct people to those themes, to Christians who are kind of like, well, what what should we be doing, you know, to encourage people to say, you have so much freedom as a Christian parent. 
go look, learn about neuroscience, go learn. If you believe God has designed human beings to develop in a certain way, go, go learn about that. So you can see the intricacy of that design and you can help them flourish. There's so much freedom rather than saddling people with these, um, frankly, in, in my vocabulary, I would say idolatrous notions of what God is like and how you need to operate as God like this in the life of your children because of commitments to these resources. And many of them just regurgitate the same things over and over again, honestly, they, they really do for a, for a new generation. So yeah, um, yeah it's a true. lot for people to untangle, I think. And um, when we went to write this book, we were kind of surprised there hadn't been one written yet because a lot of people are re-examining a lot of these teachings. But I think parenting teaching gets a pass often because who rereads it really, right? Like the parents aren't going to reread it. A lot of times the children who grew up with it aren't necessarily rereading it. And then societally, we still hold a lot of myths about family life, even outside the church. Um, and it's kind of sacred, sacrosanct. So anyway, I was, was going to say too, is really as part of our culture. I remember even, uh, I, I loved Andy, the Andy Griffith show growing up and I yeah. remember that that wasn't necessarily a religious show. They, they occasionally went to church, but you know, it was by and large, not religious in, in any way. And I remember an episode where he, he tells, Andy tells Opie, he's like, you did something wrong and we're, we're going to go out back and you're going to get a whooping. And yeah. I don't think it was necessarily about, uh, about, you know, Christian theology. It just, you did something really bad and you know what, you know what you deserve. You know what, this is the outcome. And one thing I did want to ask about is, is just, you know, when you look at Christian parents who some of whom are willing to rethink this, they're not necessarily on a deconstruction path and they're certainly not on a, on a deconversion path. They're quite happy to go to church and to love the Bible and to love Jesus and the gospel, but they're willing to at least go far enough to say, I, I have in some ways made some really bad choices about my parenting Maybe they themselves see that see themselves as a victim, like this was what was done to me. And I just I thought this is what I had to do to be a good Christian. I now see myself as someone of a, as a, of a victim, but also I'm a victimizer because I'm doing this to my kids. I'm wrong. And maybe they feel like there's there's shackled as to what do I how do I parent now? Because now my kids are gonna pick up eventually that there's nothing to be afraid of anymore. Like you don't have yeah. to be afraid of the paddle, the wooden spoon is going away. Yeah. Um, my hand is is only going to be used for for the hugs and gentle caresses going forward, and so at that point, like how how would you talk to a you know Christian if you were just you know chatting one on one with a friend to say how how do you maybe ap- apologize to your kids if they feel like that's uh, an important part of this, and then also how do you move forward to to start to explore other ways to do it where you you really bring bring that autonomy and and a child's, you know, respectability, you know, bring, bring the, the respect for, of their personhood into this. And yeah. just to say, it's, it's time to switch and, you know, don't, don't, don't get um, tempted by the messages of your past or anymore on this stuff yeah. or those, or Jim Dobson or whatever, like make, make a firm line in the sand and take a new, new, new direction with this. There's so much anxiety as to how do you do it? Um, are, are my kids going to respond? I mean, and, and honestly, I've seen it in my life where one, once the kids know that they are completely, utterly safe from any physical harm, yeah. they do take advantage of you. They definitely do. So it's yeah. not an easy path. No one's saying this is easy, but to make that switch, and especially if you feel like you have actually done something that you would yeah. consider abusive and you need to apologize and make it right. Like, how do you advise parents to start thinking through that? Yeah. And I do hear from parents. I hear from parents who carry a lot of regret. I hear from parents whose kids are grown, who just are grieving, you know, and they're angry and upset and with what they did and they're grieving what they did as parents. I mean, and they're grieving and I hear from younger parents. And so um, I, I typically first just name that, that there's a lot to be angry about and to grieve because I think sometimes we understandably want solutions, but to to note that this is impact. This is not nothing what's going on. This has generational impact. Um, and I I think in the language of today, it, it's traumatic for everyone, right? Like I do think these spanking liturgies are traumatic for children. I do think some abusive people perhaps take pleasure in dominating their children, but I think for many parents, they're forcing themselves to do it. And it's traumatizing for them as well and training them in different ways. So I think there's a lot there that is going on under the surface that 
needs some breathing room to even just get out as people reckon with that. I often will encourage parents to get curious about what drew them to those teachings, to get curious about their own history. You know, I think qualified licensed mental health counseling can be a big help here with family dynamics, even things like we talk about inside out movies, right? We talked about that earlier. Just that vocabulary is so absent from a lot of the popular Christian teaching, the idea of feelings or um, that you, there could be different parts of you activated in different ways, like equipping parents to begin to regulate their own emotions and understand how that works, I think will have trickle down. So I encourage, I point parents in that direction to skilled, qualified people, because I often think these things are tied in deeper, that it, as much as we'd like to say, just stop doing it. I think that's very hard. Like I heard from from a parent not long ago who was very distressed. They were saying, I want to stop spanking. I hate spanking. I can't kind of like I get so upset and I get so triggered and there and I appreciated her courage and also really encouraged her to get help because some of this we need to we need to I think as adults in the community be okay making other people uncomfortable to be like the vast majority of people who abuse their children I think wouldn't call themselves abusers right they think they're escalating or they think they just lost it one time or something. So I think we need to be okay help, helping each other by making adults uncomfortable rather than kind of uh, shuffling that cost onto that down to children. So really kind of I actively encourage parents to actively see, seek help and prioritize that. Um, I also think shifting the focus for Christian parents, um, I don't give a lot of recommendations, but I often people understandably want something, I will point them to, it's an organization called Connected Families. And I appreciate that because it's a Christian framework, but they also weave in neuroscience and brain research. And um, the foundation of their framework, I think it's a four-step framework, is you are safe with me. Like that is the foundation to like, let's rewind and figure out how do we set that foundation of you are safe with me. I think the next one's like, you are loved and accepted, and then you are called and capable. And finally, you are responsible for your actions. So it's kind of like a reverse pyramid to say, yeah, we, we do need to talk about uh, real life things. Like there, there can be natural consequences to behavior. How are you responsible for your decisions to make? But re helping, helping parents reset that foundation, I encourage them to get curious. Like I mentioned about brain science, about child development. These things are missing from so many evangelical resources so they can kind of learn how ch what's normal behavior for a child. You know, like toddler saying no is is normal. It's it's part of a toddler individuating, a teenager individuating is is normal. So to kind of begin to be equipped to not be so on edge with those sort of things. Um, so kind of point people in those directions and then. In our book, we've developed this, but really uh, helping Christian parents in particular raise their own questions, learn to think critically about Christian parenting content they're presented with to sort of say, whoever you're listening to, your pastor, like who you're following on Instagram, whatever, like how are they depicting children? Are children spoken of with dignity and humanity or, or is it presented it as an antagonistic relationship between parent and child, like military, like parents have to win, like trying to, trying to help par equip parents so they can, if they hear a friend, if a friend hands them a resource, if they sit in a sermon that they can kind of be like, oh, there's a lot of emphasis on discipline in this sermon, that that can maybe just ping a flag for them to note that. So, so trying to help equip parents, because I think we can identify all these things in the past resources, but the parents who are currently parenting need to be able to do that in the moment because all of this has only, we didn't even get to it, but only been exponentially multiplied in influencer culture, right? Like anybody can set themselves up as a parenting expert, do a total facade, right? Like, and to some extent that happens in books and seminars, but so much more so in influencer culture and sell an aesthetic, sell an ideal. There's no personal relationship or ability to have accountability. 
to even see what the repercussions of it are. So really to try and equip equip people to do that. Um, and then uh, as far as apologizing to children, I think um, attempting repair is something uh, evangelical Christians as a whole, this is a huge generalization, which might get me in trouble, but I think we're really uh, ill-equipped to do is attempt repair. I think um, part of what got me into this research was um, advocacy for survivors of abuse in church spaces. And so these dynamics mirror each other, right? I think uh, the way children in families are written about and talked about in resources, family life teaching in church communities is how adults will be treated and spoken of in the church family. So in the same way that I think we don't really know how to attempt repair, we 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 teach little formulas of say you're sorry and offer forgiveness, but we we don't know what it means to attempt repair, to attempt rep, you know, to make it right, to try and make something right, to own it um, in a way that's honest, to be able to listen to someone else's experience without defensiveness. So I sometimes, depending if it's appropriate or not, I'll encourage people to learn about active empathetic listening, because I think that's like a precursor to being able to apologize, to be able to name the harm. Um, But I think I think I'm feeling a little bit of pause about the apology, mainly because depending on the age of the child, that can put the onus back on the child to make the parent feel better about what they, you know. So I think that's something that really needs to be sorted out carefully because sometimes that can feel like a child now has to carry their parents' regret. Um, But I think certainly for older children and adults, it can be very meaningful. There was a fantastic thread that went viral on Twitter last year sometime. Um, I think a pastor was asking what adult children want to hear from their parents because he was talking about how he is pastor of an elderly congregation. So sees a lot of older people estranged and confused. So he was kind of wondering about that. And it was just reply after reply of just adults longing to hear, I'm sorry. That's it. It's like it. And it was a heartbreaking thread to read, but just longing for any semblance of that. So I think certainly with adult children, that can go a long way instead of Mm. we did the best we could or, you know, the kind of cliche things that come. Yeah. I do think that one of the things that's been helpful to me, though, is to to really give my kids the example of saying it's okay to shift with, with more information, with better thoughts. You know, when you know better, you do better, that kind of thing to say, you know, I especially, you know, regarding Christianity, I did not know that the gospel stories, like the one you mentioned about, you know, you'll know him by his scars. That's directly copied out of the story of Odysseus. Odysseus was known by his scars. You know, when you, when you know where the, the gospel stories come from, it changes your perspective on the gospels. When you know better ideas about corporal punishment, it changes your perspective. And I think for, for my kids to, to, to have that example to say, number one, there's what you can change your perspective and you can become a better person and to have a parent do that as a, as a a major way, as an example, it's, it it feels humbling and it feels like, shouldn't I be the the big shot in charge? And shouldn't I be the example? Like, no, you really shouldn't. You should, you, you, you're the example of humility, the example of being the best you can be and shifting when you realize you've made mistakes. Um, But I also think it's, it's amazing too, to realize that when you, when you go through this stuff, you realize that the, the the goal of having children feeling safe and like I, I think you were talking at one point uh, about the idea of how for some people they just they get to the point where there's they always feel like somebody's angry at them yeah. you know and to to realize like I want my child's inner voice that voice that's in their head that I can't hear but it, they're talking to themselves which in some ways is 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 you know in these formative years it's me talking to them their inner voice is me that I want that the majority of that inner voice to be simply I love you. I accept you. You're safe. You're awesome as you are. And the more that you get into that mindset, the more you kind of see yourself. It's almost like a, a, a you, you create a filter and a, a primer for you to see to, to sort of psychoanalyze yourself and say, I, I've really made some mistakes. And once you see one or two, you're like, 
okay, what, why did I let that, why did I let that really horrible choice become my parenting style? And once you deconstruct that and say, that's, I'm not going to do that anymore. That's not my toolbox anymore. I'm pulling that back. You start to do it in other areas. And it just, you, you, you get to a point where you're like, I really, this isn't just about parenting. This isn't just about um, Christianity. This is about anything. Like I want to start to take more control of what information I let in and say, is this really good information or not? How would, how would you know if it's good information? Like you said, when you hear a pastor talk about discipline all the time, how do you know when to put your red flags up and to say, I've got some concerns here to get that filter really tight and to, and then, and to put it on yourself and say, am I really a healthy person? Am I really a healthy parent? And, and to realize that those choices that you make in your own psyche, in your own emotions, that those choices that you make about yourself are going to impact them. And I, I know when I was a Christian, we talked all the time about generational curses. Mm -hmm. And it was like, you know, the, we need to break the generational curse of divorce, no more divorce in our family or this or that. And you realize that some of these generational curses, if you can, if I can borrow that phrase still, are, are just really being abusive in different ways. Some of them very small, some of them very big. But being abusive to children and to say, I I just I gotta break this cycle. I it's it's stop the chain of all this bad stuff yeah. stops with my generation. Yeah. And I just I love that. And I feel like yeah. it's 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 hard to humble yourself, but to equip your kids with that to say, when you give them that example, they're hopefully going to then as they grow up think, I can humble myself too, just like my dad had to eat humble pie and change gears. Yeah. I can do the same thing in my life when I'm wrong. It's okay to be wrong. It's okay to it's admit okay it. It's okay to be wrong. And it's not the end of the world, which I do think the eternal stakes make it feel like that for a lot of Christian families. If it's wrong, it's the end of the world. It's the end of my child's future. It's the end of everything. And I think, I think it also, the last maybe thing I'll say is like, I think a another piece of why adults, Christian adults are so, um, reticent, reluctant to give up corporal punishment is it requires that reckoning with their own parent parents <laughs> and a dethroning of their own parents. And that can be very uncomfortable to uh, reckon with their own parents' fallibility and be the betrayal that allowed adults to treat children this way. My pet theory is this is why when you hear adults who advocate for spanking, whether as adults who are saying, I was spanked and I turned out fine, or adults who are saying, no, you need to do this, there will always be laughter. Even, even in the broader culture, like Tucker Carlson's horrible, horrible talk a week ago, he brought in spanking of children and the whole place is laughing. And um, even by the metrics of people who think spanking can be carefully done, it's not a funny moment, right? Like it's a moment of corrective discipline. It's certainly not a funny moment for the child, but I do think we purge something through our laughter and whether it's this weird dominance violence or whether I kind of think there's a lot of discomfort with what it means to have once been children who are so vulnerable and really children are the most vulnerable def demographic. They they can't advocate for themselves. They They have no agency. They're dependent on their caregivers. They don't know until they get older, if what their experience is not normal, right? Like it normalizes it. So um, it's an incredibly uh, sobering thing to be entrusted with the care of children, which is the language I prefer to having children even or owning them to be entrusted with their care for a short time, because that's what we have is it just a short time. And um, I uh, think this is something I love. Thank you so much for having me on. I love uh, that you were willing to do that, because I think this is something that people don't need to be ideologically aligned or religiously aligned to say, let's advocate for the most vulnerable in our communities. Let's work to have safer families. Let's work to have safer communities. Um, and let's hold each other as adults accountable to saying, let's no more of this. Like we can, we can stop this collectively together. Mm. What a great thought. If I could be uh, devil's advocate here to sure. take us back to where we started from deconversion. Yeah. Yeah. I think one of the things too, that could come into this equation of why it's hard for evangelicals to mm -hmm. think through this. Um, number one, there's this issue of like, we alone have the word of truth and everyone else is wrong, wrong, wrong. And it's going to have eternal consequences. You know, 
we're, we're, we're kind of the savior of the world, even though God's the savior, we're kind of the savior's voices. We really are. Yeah. <laughs> but apart from that, there's also this sense of, um, I think if people think through it enough, and I know that a lot of people don't, even though they should, and, and I include myself in it, I should have thought through this. But when you start to say to yourself, maybe I shouldn't beat the shit out of my kids, mm-hmm. just maybe. And maybe I need to start seeing them radically differently. Mm -hmm. The one of the things that happens, and this is part of deconstruction that often does lead to deconversion, is you begin to look at the psychopathic nature of the Yahweh character and say, even though there's not that many verses that directly address parenting in the Bible, there's an awful lot of examples of him as a parent that are really, really bad. Uh, Like you mentioned, even the snake on the pole, but in that context of that story, he was killing his own children with snake bites. Like what kind of father does that? Um, right. Or going back to Adam, you know, the, the Garden of Eden, what kind of father lets his children play in the garden knowing there's a snake that's the enemy of their souls? This, this, this character is, is not a good father. And I think you're going to end up for a lot of people when they say, I don't think I should act this way towards my kids. If the wheels are turning enough, they're going to say, I don't think Yahweh should act this way toward his kids either. Mm-hmm. And if you're used to bowing your knee and saying, I do not judge God, God judges me. I do not stand and, and say, God, I'm going to, I'm going to tell you whether you're doing something right or wrong. I completely submit. And I listen to him. He's the judge of the earth. Will not the judge of the earth do right. And if all of a sudden you're saying, I'm kind of judging God, aren't I? I'm kind of judging Yahweh. I'm kind of saying he's a shitty daddy. Um, that's hard to take. That's hard to swallow. And all of a sudden you say for the first time, I'm better than God. I'm a better parent than Yahweh. That is a very hard pill to swallow. And for a lot of people, they do. that's exactly where they connect the dots. They say, yeah. this God commanded slavery. He commanded the child rights, stoning, land theft. You know, the, the children uh, back in the day would be gay, stone them. They'd have sex outside of marriage, stone them by God's command. Would a father drown his own kids in the pool? Of course not. Well, God kills everybody except for Noah and his family in the flood. You realize over and over and over, you find yourself saying, I'm a better person. I'm a better character. I'm a better parent than Yahweh has ever been. And I think for a lot of people, if, and I'm not trying to put you on the spot here, but saying, I think for a lot of people, if you connect those dots enough, you'll realize there's that whether or not Yahweh is real, you know, People need to maybe do more research into comparative mythology and say, where did Yahweh, the Yahweh character even come from? How did he evolve? Because he, he's not the monolithic character that we end up with in the Bible. There's an evolution that you can clearly see. But you know, when you just say, if, if he were real, if he is real, do you want him to be? And that's an important question. A lot of people are going to put those pieces together and eventually say, you know what? I'm a number one, I'm a better parent than this guy. And number two, if he's real, I don't know that I want him to be real. I don't know that I could worship such a God. And that's where a lot of people, when you start putting those together, you're like, okay, this stopping spanking seems like this one little issue, but it is to many people a slippery slope. I am getting into a yeah. secular perspective and who knows where this thing lands. I could deconstruct and end up going all the way with this. And it's a scary place which, to be. Which can't. And I do hear from people who that becomes. I certainly hear people's stories. I would say counterpoint. Is there people who are still in the faith who would say, oh, or what if everything I've thought about, to use your words, the Yahweh character, what if everything I've thought about the Lord is wrong or incomplete? And I think of it as either way, it's an invitation to curiosity whether it leads someone to say, and nope, I'm pretty right about who I think him to be, and I am going to sit in judgment and pass, or perhaps there's an invitation. Maybe there's more than two paths. I don't know, but like I, I see it from my perspective. There's an invitation to say, oh, but what if? What if actually he's not interested in child sacrifice? You know what? What if he actually really? didn't want that. Um, I think there, there are interesting questions, like threads to pull on there that is a path for people who find themselves deconstructing at that crossroads. I'm unconvinced that it, it has to be all or nothing because I think there is a framework that says, 
in the same way, like for instance, these books, we could say, I don't think what they're presenting is the gospel, is penal substitutionary atonement. It could be that they they are presenting that and it's just wrong. Or it could be that that message is wrong. That that those glasses, like I think there's a sense of which if there's a reality there and we're putting on different glasses, it could be that the glasses we're wearing are that blurred. Maybe you're right that it turns out you take the glasses off and there's nothing there. Um, or it could be that there's a different way of seeing it. So I think e- for in any case, I do think for many adults, particularly if they were raised in the church, having children becomes a point of question in the same way that I think entering new relationships can be or moving to a new community can be. I don't think it only has to come through having children, but these sort of like pivotal life transitional changes offer an opportunity to stand and take a different perspective and, and see what, see which way they want to go, which, okay. Can I land here? I know you need to go, but that verse, okay. In the way they should go, because it always gets brought up as the promise. And um, I think this is one of those like flip on the head things. I think it's helpful for those listening who are like, but what about that? Like, what if, isn't there a way we can do this and make sure we have a right way to do it. I think um, in studying it for the book, it is simply a descriptive wise saying that says the things experienced in childhood are formative. Like that, that is a, a truth universally acknowledged, you know, that the, the way children are treated in childhood will shape the way they go in some fashion. Um, which is, again, like I said several times, all of these things are are sobering. It's an incredible thing to be entrusted with the care of other human beings. So, yeah. yeah. The one thing I will say, I, I, I do that I, a lot of people tell me this and I felt it myself, but I, when I was a Christian, one of the hardest mm-hmm. parts was it really did feel like God was very, he was very confusing. And mm-hmm. so like, for example, this question of what is the nature of the gospel? Is it about substitutionary atonement or not? Um, you'd, you'd say, well, for hundreds of years, maybe thousands of years, a certain part, pieces of it, everybody that was like within the church thought it was that way. And then, you know, this other offshoot church said, no, it's this way. And you have right. these, these big groups and you'd say, well, let's just go back to the word of God. It's like, well, well which one? There, We know there's four gospels, but we don't know who wrote them. And there originally were 50. And which maybe, interpretation? Which interpretation? And which, which ending? And, yeah. yeah. And it's like you end up getting to the point of saying, okay, well, if there's that much at stake, both for time and eternity, why doesn't he just make it much more clear? Is he is he not the God that is not the God of confusion? And it's just, I ended up thinking, that was one of the biggest questions in my mind in the, in the yeah. last, I'd say, week or two of my time in Christianity after 43 years was saying, yeah. this book just looks so confusing and so hodgepodge It just yeah. looks like it's very man-made. And yeah. as like, God, if, if the God of the universe wrote this or inspired this, he could have done a hell of a lot better where's the better version of this, the much better version, the clearer version. Yeah. And uh, it just, it, it definitely broke my heart that in many ways at that juncture that I was like, this just, this just kind of reeks of just, this is just man-made, both man-made in general, but also man versus women, man-made, mm. uh, very, pat- very patriarchal. Yeah. And um, well, and I think as someone who's like a novelist, right? Like I love the idea of story. And sometimes I think about this for me, it's been really interesting and I'm not an expert by this in any means, but I've listened to uh, quite a number of Hebrew scholars, like Jewish scholars. Um, And I find it really fascinating to hear from them completely different perspective on what it means to read the Tanakh or something like this. Yes. That most evangelical Christians would hold. And I do think there's space enough to have multiple readings. I I'm very reticent to be like, let's figure out the right one. I think we don't read literature that way of any kind. So it's, it's not helpful. I think it leads to what you're saying, this idea that the Bible is the roadmap for life. And why isn't it clearer rather than what are, what are we finding in this story? And um, for me, it makes me think of like, do you play uh, video games? I'm not a big video gamer, but you know, like no, the difference between like the quest versus the sandbox of like, but what if it's not the like quest of like, get it right and do it right? What if it's more the sandbox of 
connection again. And again, those sort of models become paradigms. What if it's about God drawing near in connection and not about us doing it right? But I think the the wide variety, the I don't know, some of it is I think you're right. People are af- afraid because there's a fear that examining things will lead to complete unravel. But from a perspective of a person of faith, I would say like the trust is there regardless. Like if I'm trusting that God is good, I'm trusting that he's good in the sense of not in an unthinking way, but in a sense of that is going to displace some of these other things. And I think where it gets topsy-turvy is when people feel like these doctrines, this scaffolding has to be preserved or else it will all crumble. And I definitely resonate with that. Like either God is capable of sustaining his church and engaging with people or not, or not, or he's not interested, you know, like it's not on us, on me as a Christian, on us as the Christian community to prop that up. Like, I think because I think that's legitimate, I'm not concerned or worried about it. But I do think there there can be a lot of worry within the community of like, like we need to defend or or uh alienate the people who've left. What did you say people traitors? You feel like people are referred to as traitors, like treat people like that. I don't know. Yeah, for sure. Well I I have one quick thought and then I'll I'll I'll, I'll pass the ball to you one last time for for if you think of a parting shot here. But uh, my last thought was going to be just when I was a Christian, the best thing that I could have ever heard in my future mm-hmm. out there would have been, well done, faithful servant. Well done, mm-hmm. good and faithful servant. I wanted to see the face of my Lord and Savior more than anything. I wanted to see the face of the God who um, had saved me, the, mm-hmm. the Lord who had died in my place. And I wanted to hear him say, well done, good and faithful servant. Now that that's all changed, obviously, the, the most one of the most important things I could say I would want to hear is my kids when, you know, right now they can't understand all the issues. They can't understand all the moving pieces, but someday they will. Someday they'll look back and say, we, we, we understand enough to know what happened mm-hmm. over those years and we can put the pieces together. And I do expect that probably at some point they're going to say, thanks for making those choices. Those mm-hmm. must have been hard choices. Thanks for making those. You, mm-hmm. you, you literally changed our lives by the choices mm-hmm. you made. Mm-hmm. And I, I look forward to that. I do think that that's a critical piece and hopefully it'll be something where yeah. they can also mm-hmm. in turn pass some of these, you know, under their, yeah. their uh, kids. And, you know, every generation has things that they're, they have blinders on for it. So there's things that mm-hmm. my kids are going to make mistakes somewhere that maybe my kids won't be tempted to, you know, yeah. uh, assault their children as part of their parental mm-hmm. discipline, but they might have something else that they need to realize. Like something else. Yeah. Girl. I feel like that too. Like I want to hold on to that, knowing that it will come to all of us who are parents. I think that the moment where a child, an adult child says this thing, and it's probably not going to be the thing we were aiming to correct. It's going to be the thing we were unaware of. But again, what if we've trained ourselves in humility and listening, I think that will serve us well, even if it's the unexpected, you know, anyway. Yeah, absolutely. Was well, there anything else we would add as a final word to our listeners? I don't think so. Thank you for the opportunity. Um, I'm happy to connect with anyone who would like to process more or learn more about our project or just engage with um, content. We have a variety of playlists that look at different themes or offer thoughts on different resources. Um, but yeah, thank you for the opportunity to talk. Great conversation. I really enjoyed chatting. Yeah, absolutely. Likewise, very much. Well, I'll just yeah. wrap up the uh, saying we've been speaking with Marissa Burt. Uh, I'll have the links beneath this video for all of the ways you can get in touch with her. The book we talked about is not yet available, but you can uh, check out our other books, which are more of the fantasy sci-fi books, as well as her her website. Uh, and all that. So please do like and subscribe and all that. But uh, Marissa, very good to uh, get to know you. Thank you so much for your time today. I really appreciate it. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you too. Thank you. Have a great day. (laughs)